Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to episode 157 of Songs of Salah here on 17 Numa Radio. Thank you for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Scott Thomas Outler, and it is Tuesday, August 17th, 2021. Coming up in the next segment, I'll be joined by tonight's guest, Kathy Ellis. I've known Kathy for several years now, having read alongside her at different poetry venues in the Atlanta area. She'll be coming on tonight to talk about her new book, Wings from Roots, which was released recently back in June. Kathy also hosts workshops and readings with the Johns Creek Poetry Group. I'm looking forward to finding out what's been going on with that event lately, as well as what inspired her new collection. So stay tuned for a conversation with Kathy Ellis, as well as a selection of her poetry in just a bit. And in the meantime, please be sure to subscribe to the channel while you're listening to the show And if you're interested in checking out past episodes of Songs of Salah, they can all be found in the archive at 17numa.com. Underneath the Milky Way, a jolt of electricity is received. A pulse of peace is bestowed in blessing. A shockwave of higher resonance frequency is felt throughout the flesh as a subtle shiver taps the spine deep in the base of the bones. Whether it be by stepping under the canopy of a fig tree in the heart of summer's heat to cross through a portal and enter a wonderland of ripened fruit hanging overhead by the hundreds, or whether it be while walking beneath a sidereal map of the constellated grid with key stars blinking as crystallized diamonds with red and green flashes of light that signal the vibrations of source encoding, or whether it be stationed between two walls and a vaulted ceiling some many years ago in a house of old, with posters of incubus and nirvana interwoven to create an archway of heaven that imbues the living room with the energetic inspiration of muses and music, or whether it be in the form of a rainbow appearing after a storm subsides as the roaring sun reemerges to bless the earth with its holiest wonders of bliss. It's all cut from the same cloth, a blanket finely woven, a jeweled net of Indra, an enmeshment of synchronicity, a divine web of nature's sublimity, a mandala of manifesting matrices, a concordance of congruent alignment, a balance between order and chaos, a clarion call, a karmic scale weighing out, a heart and a feather, a seat of the soul, an eye of Horus, a pineal transformation, a transcendent alteration, an apotheosis, a revelation, a renaissance, a consciousness in bloom and bursting. Hold the helm steady as the ship sets sail. And now for a little dose of recent news stylized in the form of chaos theory. A butterfly flutters its wings across the street. An earthquake rumbles in Haiti. The Taliban overtakes Afghanistan. A blind man points in a backwards direction. Smoke gathers in the western sky. Medical quarantine tents are set up by authoritarians in the front yards of Australian citizens like some scene out of E.T. Aliens shake their heads in disbelief. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of protesters take to the streets in 15 major French cities. Canadians march in mass as signs of a resistance grow stronger throughout the world. 
Tyrants twist the Patriot Act to label Americans as potential domestic terrorists as the always intended application of the Trojan horse legislation is finally brought to light and manifested. French police patrol outdoor cafes to harass the patrons with demands to see their papers. German forces attack the elderly and children as visions of the new Reich become brutally apparent. Human trafficking drug cartels run their deadly scheme on the southern border. The Secretary of Defense dons a weird mask that mirrors his likeness to that of Darth Vader. The banksters buy up foreclosures to consolidate more power. Klaus Schwab announces the globalist Great Reset with the international communist phrase, You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Liberty takes a punch to the gut. A dragonfly flutters its wings across the sea, and the beat of the new world order marches on. But enough of all that for now. I'm excited to share the good news that my new book, Evermore, written in collaboration with my co-author and soul friend, Mihaila Melnik, is going to be released later this month as the flagship title for 17 Numa Press. What a journey it has been reaching this point. It was over two years ago that Mickey first sent me her poem, Evermore, which was written as an homage to Edgar Allan Poe's famous The Raven, we had already been sharing our new poems with each other for years at that point. I would send Mickey my poems from here in Atlantis, and she from her home in Caput Mundi, Italy. But this piece struck a particular nerve with me, based largely on what and who it was written about, along with the great satirical vein it was produced in. I hope you'll pick up a copy to find out the particulars of just what I mean. So upon my initial reading, I immediately told her that Evermore needed to serve as the centerpiece for a book, and thus the original concept for our project was born. Over the next year, the idea hung loosely in our minds, and as we continued writing new poems and sharing them with each other, whenever one had the energy of Evermore, we'd shove it in a special file until we eventually accumulated enough material for a book. It all started with the general thought that each of us would contribute 50 poems, which seemed as if it would lead to a nice size collection in the end. Once we hit the 100 poem mark, I sent the file containing my poems to Mickey, and she then began the process of organizing and sequencing her and my poems together, interweaving them and creating the initial thread for an overall storyline. A month or so later, she sent the new file back to me, and we then went through it together reorganizing, shifting pieces around, and making subtle switches to continue whipping it into shape. In December of last year, I began the process of editing and fine-tuning the English versions of her poems, as well as making any changes to my own that might help bring them more in line with the overall arc of the book's themes. This phase of the process lasted for four solid months, and we both dug into every poem with eagle eyes and a fine-tooth comb, as the intensity of the editing process played out, we realized that we needed more poems to fit in certain spots and help serve to flesh out scenes in the overall storyline. So we entered back into a creative frenzy. We wound up adding another 70 or so poems, as well as a handful of short stories and personal memoirs to create an updated draft of the manuscript. We also completely rewrote and revamped the opening scenes and did some major reconstructive surgery on the entire storyline, placing new elements into the metaphors and archetypal concepts to make them sing with a deeper tone. And now, the cover is complete. A proof copy should be arriving in the mail by next week. And then, after two years dedicated to bringing this book to life, it will be ready for release into the world. Out of all the creative projects I've worked on in the past, including my six previous books, this collaboration with Mickey has been the most rewarding and fulfilling experience of all, and it is the effort I'm most proud of. We are both extremely excited to share what we affectionately refer to as the farm with everyone, so please tune in here on the show in coming weeks and check out my social media accounts for more information about Evermore's imminent publication. You can also keep in touch with me and follow my work, including recent essay and poetry publications, at 17numa.com. All right, that'll just about wrap things up here at the top of the show. Let's head into a music break now and then return on the other side with tonight's guest, Kathy Ellis. Stay tuned.
when there's a journal that accepts your poem or an online venue of, of any sort, it, it just it, it, it just reconfirms. It's like, yeah, okay, this is great. You get the acknowledgement and to keep going with it. Absolutely. Those first publications always stay with us, and I think it's a reminder that this personal art form that might be introverted, uh, we realize that there's that larger community out there that's connecting on those same wavelengths, and it's nice to know that it exists and how wide it really is and immerse into it. Oh, that's really true. In fact, that's how I met you was at a poetry reading, and that was about maybe a year I had been writing and um, going to um, Phoenix and Dragons. And, you know, it was just like you meet these wonderful people and what you mentioned, like the floodgates, it's like one door opens, another door opens, and you, you be, you know, you're inspired by how other people write what they attempt to do and how well they do it, and it's just fantastic. Speaking of those uh, poetry events that you got out to, you're a member of several different uh, organizations here in the Atlanta area. How did you get connected with the Johns Creek Poetry Group? Well, I went online, and I just went, okay, I'd like to have, like, uh, you know, once a month kind of poetry group and get critique and get some ideas. Well, wherever I went, either the groups were full or they weren't happening anymore. And uh, and then I found the one in Johns Creek, and I felt like that was a possibility, and that's how I got started because I, I live in Sandy Springs, John, Johns Creek at the time seemed like so far away, but really, you know, the, I, I think the distance in Atlanta is getting smaller. And so Johns Creek was like, well, let me try Johns Creek. And they were so warm and receptive, and um, I, I, it was a very nurturing place, and I, I really grew a lot there. How have you all been running things the last year and a half or so with everything that's been going on? Have, have you all gotten back to in-person meetings, or did you turn to technology during this time? Yeah, we we did like everybody else. We went on Zoom, and, um, you know, we would meet in the library uh, Saturday mornings, and then the library was getting remodeled, and so we had to look for another library. So we went from Johns Creek to Alpharetta, which has a beautiful public library, by the way, and we met there. And then uh, they were, I forgot what was going on there. I think that's when the pandemic started. So they just kind of closed up. And so we went right online. And we've been having monthly Zoom meetings that just continued. And we have been talking about a meeting face-to-face on location But the challenge now, we've got some variant, you know, COVID and and all of that. Um, We're still talking about it. But we did have the okay to to regroup at the first library that we were at. But now they're closing to groups. So we remain online. Well, hopefully everything will clear up at some point in the unknown future. But, um, yeah, that Alpharetta library, is that the one – with the auditorium and stage? Yes. Yeah. I've been there once. Yeah, that is a very nice library. It'd be cool if y'all could get back in there. That'd be awesome. I know. I know. It was a very nice facility uh, that they had. But quite frankly, I like the one in Jones Creek. It was, you know, when you start off, I guess it's the first one that you go to. It becomes more like home. And I think the location worked better for us. Uh, sometimes when you move the location of poetry groups, it, it, it changes the dynamics as well as when you're on location and it goes Zoom. It also changes the, lo- the uh, dynamics for better or good. You know, sometimes it goes in a very positive way, um, which I thought that's what Zoom does. Um, I think it's a very positive thing to do. It doesn't read as well. The poetry doesn't read it as well. 
um, I think there is something to be said. I'm a great Zoom creature. And I do a lot of my business on Zoom. But what what I have found talking with other people that who who write poetry, they also say the same thing, that when it comes to reading of the poetry, it's much better on location. Oh, I would agree with that 100%. Yeah. There's something about the right. energy of being in the same room and feeling the vibration even of the material as it's coming out and just the warmth and the energy of poets being around each other is cool. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So your uh, lifestyle seems perfectly lended to poetry and writing in general, having been such a world traveler and visiting all these countries through your life. Can you talk a little bit about that experience of what it's been like living in all these different places and what that's brought to your life? Well, yeah, it's a big part of my life um, because my profession is cross-cultural communication training. And so through traveling and through going to these different countries, it's also like a little school for me. I, I learn a lot. I look for that. I'm a very curious person. I'm also adventurous. And um, I think through that, it begs the questions of how – people think differently and how they live differently and to have respect for that. So, but my upbringing was in a small town in Michigan and it was through a series of events. I became a a foreign exchange student when I was 17 and that opened up my world. And up to that point, I had never been on an airplane. I had never been in another country other than Canada, which was right next door to where we live. And I had never been in an apartment. So these kind of things, it was kind of this very isolated kind of living. But I became very inspired by the foreign exchange students as an elementary student that would come and visit your classrooms and talk about their country. And I said, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. And that's what I did. And that just opened up the door. I had gone to the Netherlands. And then um, I had gone, and then after that, I I went to other countries as well. And my first job, uh, when I graduated, I went to Michigan State University. And the first job that I got, because uh, I was an education major, a teacher, and the jobs were very slim in Michigan at that time. And they had an internship program to a, a country in Central America and Guatemala. And that was my first job, was in Guatemala, which is south of Mexico. And then I remained living in uh, five different countries in Latin America with a total of about 10 years. And I also studied in Spain. I studied uh, Spanish in Spain for the summer. And um, so I, I would say a total of 10 years that I spent outside of the U.S. And then in addition to that, traveling to all these wonderful countries on the on this planet you know it's an amazing thing so i think that combination of of traveling and then my profession um how it lends itself to poetry are the impressions you you have these impressions because the landscape changes uh, the temperature changes, the food changes, all of these things. And sometimes that kind of brings out these other parts of ourselves that we didn't know that we had. So it can pique your interest. It can pique your curiosity, and it kind of draws it out in some way. And I couldn't tell you, like, the percentage of of the poetry that is influenced by different cultures, some more indirectly, some directly influenced by, by the travel and different cultures. Well, having been to so many different cultures and getting all those experiences, they must have at this point amalgamated to some degree and uh, all be swirling there inside of you. You don't know necessarily which one's cropping up at any <laughs> given time and what mood it's going to send you into. Oh. Uh, <laughs> That is so true. That is so true because um, they say, like, after you live a certain amount of years in a certain culture, in a certain country, 
your mind begins to change, and you you may not realize it. Um, that usually about the third or fourth year, if you've integrated somewhat into the country, um, that the mind begins to change, and that's really true. Because um, I had lived uh, seven, a total of about seven years in Brazil, and I could, I, I definitely can mark a time when my mind shifted, and it was between the third and fourth year, and I just went, okay, I am now Brazilianized, <laughs> so to speak, you know, getting Brazilianized or whatever the the culture having those influences, and that must be similar to some degree as well. With speaking multiple languages, do you find yourself in the poetry thinking in different languages um, at times when you're writing? Yes. Um, uh, Yes, it does. It does. And it's an odd thing. It really is an odd thing. Everybody has their own influences or how they are connecting with language and words and so forth. And so it's funny, Spanish jumps in. It, it just jumps in. And so a lot of my poems might be peppered with some Spanish words, but Portuguese doesn't. And so Portuguese, it's like I have another relationship with Portuguese, and then I have a certain kind of uh, connection with Spanish. And it's it's a... You know, like, I, I think it's kind of an odd thing, but it's okay. And so, yeah, most definitely having the, because there's certain things, certain words that hold special meaning that cannot be translated into English or into another language. It's, it's a whole cultural concept that is very hard to translate. That is an interesting idea of trying to, keep the original intention of where the energy springs from uh, in your consciousness. One of the uh, things that I read in an interview of yours online was that you referred to yourself as a bridge engineer, uh, sort of a description of what you do through the ESL and other workings um, professionally and then with your poetry as well. Can you expand on that concept a little bit of what it is to unite these cultures and bring people together and what type of uh, joy that brings to your life? Well, thank you, yes. Um, You know, there's different types of bridges. So when we look around, you know, what is the purpose for building this bridge, a pedestrian bridge, a bridge over water, uh, a bridge made out of what material? Is it a drawbridge? And so I began to think about, you know, when you are working with different cultures, and it's not only national cultures, it's knowing your own culture. You know, Edward Hall said, when you leave your culture, you, you begin to really realize what it is your, about your culture, because other things will stand up against it, you know, kind of triggers, and then you begin to realize what that identity piece is. And so with bridges is the purpose of that. What is the connection between, it can be between people, it can be uh, a team, a working team, it could be two companies that are merging, two countries, uh, whatever the case may be. And you say, well, what is it? What is the vision that people have? What is the purpose? How far do they want to go with this? Is it a bridge worth building? Is it a bridge worth investing? And then you have to think after you build the bridge, you also have to think about maintaining the bridge. We have to keep the maintenance of the bridge up, maintaining, and so forth. And sometimes a bridge needs to widen up. There's, it's used so much that another bridge has to be created that runs parallel with that bridge. And so that's the way that I see, you know, as a bridge engineer is um, my part. It's kind of my life's work. And it's also part of, I think, my personality, too. Uh, I'm a bit of a diplomat. 
And I, I always want to minimize the conflict or to recognize it and to be aware of it. And what is it that um, we can do or what are, what are some potential gaps that can occur that we probably need to think about? Fantastic. Well said. And such a great metaphor for relationships in life and how they all work together. I think that's um, a lot to contemplate in what you just said and how it relates to almost every facet and aspect of life, really, uh, that can be applied. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. That's very true. So I want to turn now and get into this new collection that you put out back in June, your second book, uh, Wings from Roots. Would you like to mm-hmm. talk a little bit about what inspired it, what some of the themes and ideas in it are? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of book titles that have wings and roots in it. And my I, my mother and I, I think we had writing in common and we had dream dreaming. We're both dreamers. And, uh, you know, in this, and she would say, you know, you have wings and you have roots. And uh, so that kind of stuck with me, and I played around with it. And then I did a search online, and it was like, oh, my God, look at all these books. Like, usually it's wings and roots or, you know, different combinations. (laughs) So I found, you know, the, the power of the preposition, right? So you just go, okay, wings from roots, okay, you know. So that is what what kind of influenced that. And then um, when I looked at all the different pieces I had, I went, wow, what are my themes here? And I looked at, you know, this, these poems and I kind of grouped them all, you know, and I said, okay, I've got like seven themes going on, pretty uh, major themes that I usually write about. And so I divided up the book into seven parts. And the first part, I start with wings because the title is Wings from Roots. So what I'm doing is that I'm working with wings, the idea of taking off, the idea of exploring, the idea of um, finding kind of a pioneer, finding new things. And then I work myself back to the roots. And in between, I have the sections, like there's a section about you, people that have influenced me. And then I'm in awe. That's another section, things that that put me in awe. And then impressions, things that are not right, social injustice. And very short poems, I call them shorties. And then I went to the roots. And that's how I divided up. The, uh, the book so Covering a lot of ground In all of those subjects um, How long Was the process of Putting it together uh, What time period does the material Span over And um, What's your basic Process of writing on a more technical Aspect do you have any Sort of routines or rituals Or preferred times of day that you prefer to write? Well, I like to write uh, Friday night for some reason. Uh, Hmm. I don't know why, but that kind of is the time for me to write. I used to write a lot more in the evenings. Now I don't seem to um, have as much time or, or concentrated time. And Sundays. You know, kind of where you have that little, you've created a space in your mind and you can um, start writing on different topics. And so then the technique is kind of like my, when I start off my, my poem, it, it's a complete mess. <laughs> you know, some people have talent and they can just write a poem and it comes off the top of their head. That is not me. Mine is like a complete mess. And so, but if it's, but I'm inspired. And so what inspires me would be images. When I see an image, when I see a documentary, when I see something on the street, um, that that's not right. 
Um, and then very thoughtful, very deep kinds of things inspire me. Spiritual topics, nature inspires. So what I do, I kind of just start off and I brainstorm. I, I write down just words or phrases that I that come to my mind. I'm not even thinking about anything else. And so that's why it looks like a real mess. And then I start grouping the themes. Um, I start grouping, okay, this is, this is going on and this is going on. And then um, putting together some phrases. And then it's so funny. I don't know if this happens to you, Scott, but I start out with one idea. And then by the end of that piece, it's a complete different idea <laughs> that has happened. It kind of takes control and it just goes. And I find that that really happens a lot, a lot with I, me. I can certainly identify, especially when I get into the stream of consciousness type of things and have no idea where the tangents might go, where it's going to end up. And it's just so funny because I have this, like it's a feeling that I have. And I, and I really sit in that feeling for a while. And then I go, oh, I'm going to write about whatever the, the, the vision that I have. And then it, it's just like a horse galloping away, and it, and it just goes. And another thing that I do when I, when I feel like I have kind of a skeleton or a frame, it's, it's about halfway through, I would say, at this point. There's, I can, I've developed a theme, and I have a frame, and I have a skeleton. And what I have done over the years with my cell phone um, I collect all kinds of words that I like and phrases that I like that I have heard. I could hear them, like, let's say, on a radio, or I hear them uh, out of a movie, or while I'm reading a story, I really like this phrase, or I really like this word. Um, When I go to church on Sunday, things like this, and I have a place, I keep them in my notes on the cell phone. And at that point, when I'm going through kind of an editing process, then I will look and and I have kind of a a place that needs some work. I might resort to my notes, these notes in the cell phone. And that helps me a lot. That helps me a lot. And so I kind of go through that. But it's a beautiful feeling, I have to say, when you're in the process of writing, and it, it's, you, you see the frame. It's starting to gel. It gives me so much pleasure to, to feel that. And that's also part of the inspiration that keeps me going with writing is that feeling when it's now we're cooking, now it's gelling, now it's, it's happening. And I just love it. I think it's such a great feeling. Absolutely, and looked at from that perspective of not necessarily knowing where it's going to go, but being on the right path, it's akin to traveling in a certain sense. It's almost a a journey on the page and through your mind and um, bringing these ideas all together into that final fruition where it all sort of gels together, as you're saying. Yeah, I think it's so true, and it's so personal, you know, with each person, each writer. Um, you know, there's some techniques overall, I think, that work well with most. But it's it's a funny thing. It's, it's just something that I, I think when all the cross, cross roads come together, you know, these crossings that we make and how it it really allows for that. And sometimes it's just moving that pen and keep the pen moving and something will come up. Just something will come up. We can't force it, can we? It can't be forced. No, it's something innate and tied in with intuition and also, I guess, practice and repetition to where you learn to trust the process and know that when you get into that right mood or mindset and do just let the pen flow that something is going to come out because it's churning there on the back burners whether you 
been consciously aware of it or not. And so it's it's going to be released one way or another if you just give it. You know, that is so true. Yeah, I mean, what you said is because it's the trust. Trust in yourself, and and I think that's a big piece of it because it will come, and I never get frustrated. That's one thing. I, I It doesn't frustrate me because I know it will come, and I know that, okay, this, is, this works, but there may be something better, but meanwhile, this works. And this is okay for now. And we let it sit. You know, I always call it like marinating. You know, you let it marinate and let it cook for a while. And I've heard different thoughts on this. Even if I let it sit, sometimes I'll have a poem on my kitchen counter and I leave it out there. And, you know, I may come by like around 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon and 5 in the afternoon or whatever. And every time I come back, oh, here's a new word, here's a new thought, and you just you you just leave it there for a while, and then come back and like a like a puzzle, you know, it really is very much like a puzzle. That's I really like that application of things, and it it uh, goes back to what you were saying earlier about having these different words sort of on your phone or that you carry around in your mind and. They're just waiting for that right moment in life to hit to where they can come up and uh, serve their purpose, whether they've been there for a week, a month, or even a year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just mm-hmm. about hitting that right moment where they, uh, it's like, ah, that's why I've been um, having that on the back burner there. Exactly. Exactly. You know. So one of the things you brought up a few minutes ago, uh, you were talking about the book title and talking with your mom about dreams, is that um, an aspect that plays into your writing? Not really. Um, My dreams are so bizarre that I can't get anything from those (laughs) dreams. I mean, they're just so weird that even, you know, like I can't get anything. But I do have kind of a dream state that I am during the day, during my wake hours, you know, a bit dreamy. Uh, and that's the same with my mom. You know, my mom was a very dreamy character. And so, you know, that happens kind of when I'm awake. But I wish I could be one of these writers that use her, like Isabel Allende, you know, she uses her her dreams as a stream of consciousness, and she uses that to write. And But, yeah, unfortunately, I, I, my dreams, I would never resort to them. They're just, they're messed up like my brainstorming process you know (laughs) i've 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 found that uh my dreams are a little bit too out there for actual content and poems but i've gotten to the point where i like to wake up immediately and journal them anyway or what i can Mm. remember them just to sort of prime the pump for the day and like immediately Mm -hmm. start putting ink on the paper because it it sets my mindset in that zone of Mm. okay i've already started writing and then hmm. um, just trying to tap into the subconscious and let let them those thoughts come through throughout the day in maybe a more structured format than they originally appear when waking. I bet that works beautifully for you. It, it's it's also just a, a matter of I guess discipline for me, just knowing that okay, hmm. I'm I'm set in the right intention now for the day is is mm-hmm. the main purpose that I use it for. Yeah. Mhm. So the new collection out this June, have you been doing any um events for it yet? Anything coming up um for promotion? Well, I have um yes, I've had a uh, very good success and I really appreciate your invitation on your show. That's been one. I I really enjoy that. And um, the church that I go to, they they had just asked about a poem. And so reading there and setting up my table, my kiosk (laughs) for for the books. And uh, also at Georgia Poetry Society, uh, reading reading there. And I think it's a little bit limiting now because of 
we're kind of semi-pandemic, but it is going on, and I would like to kind of organize uh, a reading with fellow poets myself. I think that would be a lot of fun, but it's doing it's doing very well. Fantastic. Glad to hear that. Yeah, and yeah, I'm very, very happy about that. You also mentioned in your bio, once this pandemic is fully over, that you want to travel to a country a year. What's the first spot you're going to pick when uh, everything opens back up? Well, I'll tell you what, you know, it's rather what country wouldn't I pick? (laughs) You know, it's like you could put me in Mongolia. I would be fine, you know, going (laughs) anywhere. Um, And it's because I I just, I would love it. Uh, But at any rate, well, we just made plans to go to Mexico, but I've been to Mexico many times, love Mexico. Um, So that's going to happen this year, finally. Yay! And then, but then, you know, there was some talk, like, I have never been to Ireland. I've never been, there's a talk, like, I would like to go to Berlin. Uh, Certain, kind, like, Prague, these places I would be very interested in. I would be very interested in different parts of Africa. I would love to go. Would love Senegal. Uh, Different places. Kenya. All these wonderful places I would love to go. All right, well, hopefully all those still lie ahead in the not too distant future <laughs> for you. And here we'll we're coming, see. The, yeah, <laughs> coming here we'll down see. into the closing moments of the show, I want to turn things over to you if you have some pieces maybe from the new collection you'd like to share. Oh, sure. Thank you very much. I would like to share. This is out of the wings section. And uh, so what happened, I had mentioned earlier that my first job was in Guatemala. And this was during the 70s. I'm going to date myself, but it was during the 70s. And during the 70s, it was a very hot time. And so from Guatemala, I had gone to El Salvador. And during the time that I was in El Salvador, a civil war broke out. And this poem is about my experience in this one Uh, moment, not this one moment, but the whole idea of living in a civil war. It's called Blood and Beets, Beets Like the Vegetable. During the war in El Salvador, some things were not learned by explanation, common sense, following the one in front, keeping safe. Instead, I had to figure out the bizarre along the way, move through days when everything changes, comprehend addiction to adrenaline, recognize that youth was on my side, know the dangers of my own naivete, seeking truth and bearing witness to civil war, to malnourished children, machine guns chattering in the dark, helicopters in the dark, curfews, shriveled vegetables, Teenage soldiers pointing guns at you because they don't know where else to aim. Nearly 30 journalists' lives lost. The assassination of Archbishop Romero. The rape and military execution of four nuns. I stayed. Wow. What an intense period that must have been. It was. (laughs) It was. And I realized I never wrote about it. I I don't normally talk about it. Um, I think it's very hard for people to understand. I, I don't know what it is, but to, to understand, I think a civil war, it's very, it's, um, you know, I, I did because I lived through that. But um, I think it's very uncomfortable, actually. Yeah. Uh, how many, how many more may I read? Oh, uh, we've got about, Eight minutes left in the show, so... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, this is called The Intent of Matter. And I was thinking about the idea of matter. And I was thinking about the phrase, oh, it doesn't matter. And so I just kind of worked with both of these ideas. The intent of matter. Matter contains energy and substance. We are of energy and substance. Matter occupies space. We occupy space. 
What is deep with us, what is deep within us matters. Intent does not stand alone. If intent is meant to be positive, but the impact is harmful, the aftermath is unattended. We feel sorry, maybe ignorant. If the intent is meant to be harmful, the impact triggers reflexes from the past, from the depth of matter. The ripple effects stream from darkness, not from light. We cease to acknowledge the other. We hurt each other. The relationship ceases to matter. We feel we do not matter. No matter. Very nice. Love how you wove consciousness and form together in that one. Thank you. Thanks. This one is uh, from... There were some demonstrations like downtown Atlanta, uh, I think about 1918, somewhere around there in January. And there were like 65,000 people. It was amazing. And so this is, uh, as a result, this, uh, there was someone there that I, I, it just uh, impacted me so much. And this is called A Man and His Sign. Roads paved in gold makes no sense in the land of plenty. Your seven-year-old son struck by a stray bullet from a deranged gun. I'm sorry for your sorrow. Hold your sign high, the sign that holds the face of your lovely child. Let arms wrap around your wretched pain. You are here in the right place. We hold your brokenness in a tender place until the next time to march again. Mm. And this can be... uh, uh, I can make this the last one. Um, you know, it's, the thing with poems is the switching of the emotions and the moods, you know. And so there's, I think, from one day to the next or from one moment to the next, from one poem to the next, it, it changes very suddenly, you know. Uh, this one is, uh, took place in Wales. My grandfather is Welsh. I had an opportunity to go to Wales two years ago to meet my cousins for the very first time. And so this is a little poem about that. Our dinner at the Priory. In the land of lamb and fish, I ate fish every day in Wales. When I was a toddler, my father removed the slivers of perch bones. Eyes grew bigger to taste the mild flakes off his fingertips. He chuckled and was amused. I remember this. I disrupted his rest deep in the ground. On a rainy Welsh evening, my father shared sea bath with me. Salt steamed. Simplicity melted in our mouths. We ate in silence. He was proud of such a choice over the cheery clamor of a British pub. Very nice selection, and I think it's so true what you said, the different moods uh, that come out through poetry, and that's part of what it's all about, tapping into those different uh, energy fields that we carry around with us, and all of those reflected on that well. Thank you. Yes, it's so true. It's so true. And, you know, each time I read any of these poems, it pumps my heart. It it, it affects my heart. It changes the beats. And it's beating when I read some of these poems. It's like I never, it was, it's like the first time I read the poem. And it still affects me after reading it many times 
that's great to still have that tangible relationship with the work. It means it came from such a, a deep place and such a personal reflection. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you so much for joining the show here tonight, Kathy, and sharing your work and talking about your life. Really enjoyed it. Um, is there anywhere people can go to find out more about your work and to get a copy of the new book? Well, they can go to Amazon.com, and you you have to go to the book section and then put in Wings from Roots because it doesn't come up that easily. It's also an e-book. I did for the first time that experience of making it an e-book as well. And then some of my other writing, I I do a bit of writing, usually cultural themes, on LinkedIn. Uh, You'll find some essays that I've written there. And so that's mostly uh, the books that I write and then LinkedIn. And I do have a website, Intercultural English services.com but I don't use that very much for my in fact I don't use it at all (laughs) I should really just not even use my website but I guess when you have your own uh, business so to speak you know you need to have a website but it's nothing that I would write home about you know that website but at any rate you've got amazon.com and and LinkedIn and Scott thank you so much for your invitation I really appreciate it being on your program and and just answering the good questions that you have. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you coming on and all the best uh, here in the rest of 2021. You too. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh-huh. Kathy. Thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back next Monday with Alien Buddha Press. Until then, salah.